Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Football Therapy with me, your host, Jan, and welcome back to Talking Chelsea, the show where I bring a guest on where, guess what, we talk about Chelsea. And I'm delighted to say today I've got Alex Goldberg from the Byline podcast and YouTube channel um, to essentially, basically dismantle a great success at Norwich and talk about the team and squad and Frank Lampard and all things Chelsea. Alex, how you doing, man? I'm good, Jan. How are you, man? Chill, man. I'm pretty good. Yeah, I'm Phil Please Lamps has got his first win in the Premier League, finally. Um, we've got a lot to talk about, man. And I want to talk about um, where people can find you at the end, but there's a lot of stuff I want to cover. So let's start with Norwich. Um, a lot of feel-good has come out of that. If you look at it on the face of things, it's a 3-2 win against a promoted side, but it felt so much more than that. Um, because of where the team is, where the squad is, where Lampard is, and who scored the goals, um, do you feel? How do you feel generally with the performance? Like, give me like a sort of a small roundup of how you feel after that game, and just what you what you take away from the performance, I guess. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, right after the game, I said that I was ecstatic, mm. and I was, and I still am, because I think you kind of just actually touched on it. Who scored the goals? Now, I'm loud and obnoxious about Chelsea youth players, but it, this just feels better, I feel like, for any Chelsea fan than if it was an own goal and Pedro scored or Willian scored and then maybe a penalty, right? Yeah. Maybe by, by Jorginho. Mm. But this was Tammy Abraham getting a brace and really in, you know, welcoming himself uh, almost onto the Premier League stage. And of course, Lampard did as well. But then obviously Mason Mount continuing his really bright play. Mm -hmm. So it was your two youngest players out there on the pitch leading you to, and not just them, obviously, yeah. but scoring the goals to lead you to your first three points under Lampard on the road. And yeah, you said uh, Norwich is a newly promoted side, but listen, I would have said this before the game and after the game, Norwich are staying up. Mm. They're absolutely going to stay up. They are a fun side. They're a fearless side. They're a dangerous side. They clearly have players that belong in the Premier League. Obviously, Timu Puki is a very interesting story, yeah. a great story, mm -hmm. but they have other players who are really impressive. Max Aaron's the right back, their left back, Lewis. I mean, they have some nice, fun players, but more importantly, they're just a very cohesive side. And Jan, you know, the thing that really stands out to me about Norwich is they don't get down when they get scored on. They come right back at you yeah. pretty hard. And that's actually one of the reasons why I was so ecstatic about Chelsea pulling off this three points is, all right, once Chelsea scored and then Norwich immediately responded and then Chelsea scored again and Norwich respond not too far later, you kind of feel, oh no, this is at home, this is at Norwich's home, yeah. it's on the road and this could end up in another draw like Leicester City or maybe Norwich even steal it and Chelsea stay together and then once again, one of their youngest players scores that game winning goal. Mm. I think that's got to be a great feeling. Yeah. It was a great feeling for me. So you'll find people on Twitter just who want to be negative and say, oh, barely beat a newly promoted side yeah. that's not looking at the context that was a great win yeah yeah loads of salient points there mate especially you're right Norwich is a fun side but they're, they're a promoted side but they're the champions of the second division they've got they're still riding a huge feel-good factor from their domestic campaign they're obviously like you say they're at home they're a confident side they're not gonna sort of bend to other teams and they are I guess like you say a sort of feel-good story they're kind of like Although they play differently, they're kind of like the Wolves of this season, maybe. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like an mm -hmm. exciting side. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so you're right. Yeah. And, yeah, I was I was, kept, I was being a bit sort of silly when I was trying to highlight what people might be negative about it because it was a Lampard youth-inspired win. There was important sure. performances from maybe a bit more seasoned players like Kovacic and Jorginho. As Piliqueta has been a lot better, but it was inspired by... By those uh, goals from from the youngsters and we do need to just like take a minute as well and the goals we gave away um i think maybe the timu puki goal when he was running on the shoulder i mean that's a classic premier league goal that you shouldn't really be vulnerable to maybe we should be doing better but the, I'll, I'll get your thoughts on that as well in just one second but also the Ch all Chelsea goals, for my money, were wicked. Do you know what I mean? I, I loved him. Like the the first goal for Tammy, he sh I did a video on him today on my YouTube explaining how he's not only the striker 
probably in the mold of how Frank Lampard wants to play stylistically, but he's showing he's not all about scrappy poachy goals in the box. Both those finishes were excellent. Uh, it's Mason Mount's second for the, the campaign, both were excellent. So it was like, if they were, like you say, it's not just who scored the goals, it's they were scored in st style, they were lovely goals. But um, it, it does come down to a few defensive problems. Now I want to get your thoughts on that, say, Pookie goal, but generally as well, Chelsea's defensive issue, because the thing was, is, is it the space between lines? Is it Frank Lampard's tactics when he doesn't push up altogether, he leaves their space? Or, because I'm, I'm very reluctant to say it's a personnel issue. I actually think Chelsea have got very good defenders. Maybe not top tier world class elite defenders, but very, very serviceable um, Premier League defenders. Like, you know, if you look at how Arsenal are struggling or Man United have been struggling up until this summer, Chelsea are far beyond that for my money. So, so what are your thoughts on the sort of defensive structure or issues and maybe personnel as well yeah i mean i think probably heading into this season and i agree with you i actually kind of like the four they have out there i mean as pillow it's a it's an up and down mm. thing right now i do agree that was probably his best game of the season for yeah, sure but yeah. with with christensen and zuma and emerson i mean those are three players that I feel positively about. I mean, they're not players I feel negatively about. But even with that said, there's going to need to be an adjustment period. And I think we're watching that right now. And that also means their relationship with the midfield, because the midfield is obviously a huge part of some of how these goals are being scored. Now, that first goal, I mean, you could point the finger at everyone, kind of, because Norwich just made a nice team movement and went through the midfield and the defense oh, and like, just yeah. scored. Yeah, yeah and, and and to be honest, I mean, I don't like to go on my timeline when a goal is scored and see who everyone else is blaming, but I, I couldn't tell you if there was one specific player. I think yeah. it was just kind of a, a collective downfall there from Chelsea mm -hmm. and a good move by Norwich. Mm -hmm. Now that second goal, which I think Lampard said he had more of a problem with, it's interesting because first of all, you got to give credit to Timu Puki because he makes really well-timed mm -hmm. runs. I mean, really well-timed runs. Now, I had a small problem how easily that ball was advanced through the midfield and then the pass was played to Puki. Mm -hmm. Zuma, he was a step too slow there, but also Christensen was kind of caught in between two minds. It looks like he wanted to try to draw Timu Puki offside, but he was too far back. Mm. And that I've seen from Azpilicueta a number of times this season. Yeah. So to me, Jan, I don't know about you, that's a chemistry thing. That's a continuity thing. That's kind of being a defensive unit and really knowing, are we playing a high line here? Yeah. Are we gonna sit back? Uh, you know, Are we gonna even go further up so we're more compact with the midfield? Mm. So I do give credit to Puki there, but you also can certainly say Zuma's got to be a step quicker. Christensen's got to get that high line or just figure out what he's doing there. But then also, I mean, we all love Keppa, but he should have saved yeah, that. I, I mean, he, he really, yeah, he really should have saved that. So kind of on both goals, I, I have multiple people to blame. But overall, to kind of answer your question about the two goals and just the defensive unit right now, I just think it's still, and this is kind of a cheap answer in some people's opinion, but I think it is a chemistry and continuity mm -hmm. thing where the more time they spend together and also the more time Lampard spends with yeah. them, new manager in this scenario, I think they will be better and they'll know more about each other's tendencies. Yeah, that's probably the most important point. It's something that I've kind of been saying as well, that it's um, these group of players, it hasn't, it, it's the it's the opposite of, say, what Man United have been doing over the last few years in terms of throwing together. I don't want to say mercenaries because that sounds like a derogatory term for players, but, you know, mm. picked random decent players and bought them for X amount and put them together. This group of players look like, and under the coaching, look like they could have a good team synergy, a good team chemistry. But like you say, it's not something that's going to come immediately, especially when new personnel has been thrown together. And it is, yes, it's a new system. And I think, in a way... Lampard knows how he wants to play. He wants to create a lot of chances. He wants to be direct. He wants to do cutbacks, late runs from the midfield, shock horror, Frank Lampard style. But this is <laughs> this is going to sound like um, a negative, but I actually think it's a positive. I think to a degree, Lampard doesn't 100% know how he wants to play, maybe completely bottom to top. Now, that's a good thing in my eyes because it's good to have a philosophy if you're an idealist like Sari, it can serve you and it may well serve him incredibly well at Juventus but Lampard is a pragmatist he's not a boring defensive pragmatist he's a okay 
you know, we'll go to Joe Edwards, we'll go to Morris, what are we going to do here, boys? How are we going to change? And they, he will happily change all the time. And I don't think that's just formation and tactical approach. I think that will be fine tweaking from defence forward. If he's like, okay, clearly like we're screwing up here, defend, you know, space between the lines or something's happening, he he won't hide behind the philosophy um, and, you know, and just basically be blind to it sort of thing. You know, there's, um, I don't know what it's come, mm-hmm. come to my head, but I, I, I want to cite that great Jose Mourinho um, uh, quote when he was doing punditry for being sports um, for the Champions League. I don't know if you saw any of that, but he, um, mm-hmm. when Ajax got knocked out, he like talked about how, um, it, it was Spurs that knocked him out, wasn't it? Ajax. Was it Spurs? Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. So yeah. he was just talking about afterwards and he was like, uh, you know, they came with a philosophy, but now they can sit at home on the sofa watching the final with their philosophy, you know, <laughs> you know which I thought was a classic, yep. like yep. Jose, yep. like <laughs> sit at home. But so I feel like he's not wedded to anything. And I feel like because he hasn't got the ego of a Conte, a Jose, he'll know, he'll look, he'll self-assess a lot more and I think that's superb because he'll also he'll adapt when he needs to and I think that would go down to the players as well it would be like look we all want to change we all want to evolve and we're going to do this together but most importantly as a unit and I've gone off on a massive tangent here but and I've digressed but really it comes down to what you said about chemistry and knowing what each other are going to do so um yeah, so that, that's my little rant about that so that's the defense guys but I do want to talk about a few other things get your thoughts Alex um well, quickly, if if Rudiger's fit before we move on, do you what do you see the ideal partnership being, and do you think it's going to be a shift depending on opposition? Like, for example, Tamori's got a really good recovery pace, or but do you what do you think the sort of first choice two centre backs are? Well, I mean, first of all, I think you're spot on about what you just said, where Lampard might not even know necessarily his defensive identity. And I don't think that's a bad thing either. And to segue into what you just asked me, I think some of that is because he doesn't even know who he is as a manager and a coach yet. He's still young. He's clay. He's still molding himself. But the other part of that is Rudiger's not back yet. Reese James, who he keeps talking up, is not back yet. And those guys are going to get minutes within the back four. So center back wise, I mean, I feel it's really hard to totally know who the top two are going to be. Now, from what I've heard, Rudiger, when he is training, is a pretty important part of the side. He's certainly commanding. He's talkative. He's communicating with a lot of players and definitely seems like he's in Lampard's plans for this season. Mm -hmm. And you got to think that he is going to get starts. But I almost feel like the way Zuma and Christensen are now improving together, and I really more mean Zuma because he had that bad game against no, United. No. Christensen was fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Christensen was fine. You know, he, he's been pretty good throughout the beginning of the season. But if they can build a chemistry together, it really sets it up to ease Rudiger in. So I don't know if that's easing Rudiger in in a light Premier League game. I mean, he's pretty damn close to being back. So it's not like you can wait for a cup game, which isn't for a while. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like with Andreas Christensen, Zuma and Rudiger, he could play it how you just maybe mentioned it, maybe a game to game thing. And then you bring up Tamori's pace and, and maybe that would be good against a counter-attacking quick side. I still feel like Tamori, even as much as Frank loves him, will probably wait for a cup game to give Tamori a start, but it's a damn good problem to have. And if Zuma was still shaky, I would say, yeah, it's gonna be Rudiger and Christensen, but you gotta think about it here is Zuma stay. I mean, he wants to stay. He wanted to stay and make it at Chelsea, but it was very important to him that he played first team football and started or else he just would have happily gone back to Everton and been a very important player for them. Christensen, he and his father have been speaking out for a year plus about how important it is for him to start. So Rudiger also, I mean, he's in a different spot than they are career wise, but you know, Lampard has to kind of play all of them a good amount. I think he will because Jan, I think one of his biggest strengths so far is he's a man manager Absolutely. he really is a uh, he's a player's manager he understands what it's like to be a player and how to probably keep a dressing room happy so i guess a cheap answer but it's the best answer i have is 
he's going to play all three of them quite a bit and probably explain to Tamori, we'll get your feet wet in cup games. But I expect to see uh, all three of them a lot. But I once again, I think this helps ease Rudiger in that Zuma and Christensen are at least growing together a bit. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. It does seem like he does fancy Zuma and Christensen, but you forget that, that Rudy is the big recent investment of the club, isn't it, in terms of financial outlay? Mm-hmm. But in a way, that's mm-hmm. kind of... Frank will absolutely you know lay his cards on the table is his phraseology saying it doesn't matter about money does it so but um on a young man that i know you've spoken to reese james i'm a superbly talented young fullback uh, i'm a pretty pretty big fanboy of his and i think in the modern game in the premier league fullbacks are so so important arguably more than they ever have been in you know in the history of, of english football and he's the kind of dynamic player that could really supercharge Lampard's football. I think Azpilicueta obviously is going to be important because he's a senior figure. On his day, he's an excellent 1v1 defender. He's never going to be amazing going forward and he can't get up and down quickly. But his cutbacks and his crosses are getting better and we need to like, you know, get, give him a little bit of props for that. But um, I mm-hmm. imagine you agree with me on in on the fact how... Rhys James could really supercharge how Lampard wants to play and could perform incredibly well at, at this level. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing to point out is how many times Lampard in the last few weeks has mentioned Rhys James in questions that have nothing to do with <laughs> Rhys James, where where the questions are really like, who's match fit or hudson Adoy's return? And he'll always manage to slip in Rhys James. And he even said, you know, he, he said point blank, he's going to be a big player for us. And I, once again, that'll come down to Lampard being a man manager and still having Espilicueta be a pretty important part of the squad. But... The competition is clearly going to be there. The minutes are clearly going to be available for Reese James. And I think that's obvious because it was loaned out before Reese James was even 100% fit. So, I mean, that's pretty telling. Mm-hmm. Beyond that would not have happened under a different Chelsea manager. I mean, no chance does that happen under Sarri, Conte, Mourinho. Yeah. That only happens really under Frank Lampard and Jody Morris. Mm-hmm. So that's a huge vote of confidence to Reese James. And yeah, I mean, listen, I'm like the worst person to ask a question about Reese James to because if people think I'm biased towards Mason Mount or Callum hudson Adoy, I, I I mean, I, I have a hard time saying that, like, I'm as confident about a certain player as any player. But, like, with Reese James, mm. I couldn't be more confident that he's going to be a success. Yeah. And part of that is because of you mentioning where the modern-day game is at. Fullbacks are hugely, hugely important. But the other part of it is just... He really, to this point, and now I, I hear all the things, well, he played for Wigan, not a Premier League side. But if you just look at the player, just use the eye test on the player. Mm. He has absolutely everything mm. in his bag. He's a he's a very capable defender. Now, he played center back a lot for the Chelsea Academy, so he has very good defensive awareness, defensive mm. instincts. He understands playing defense, mm. and he is a beast. I mean, just look at him. He's an absolute animal yet surprisingly he has pretty decent pace he has very good technical ability as you know Wigan fans and championship fans saw last season when he had to move to the midfield to pretty much save his team from relegation Mm -hmm. so he's really good on the ball and as you know I mean how important it is for a fullback these days to be able to swing a ball into the box Mm -hmm. and Reese James's crossing is extraordinary and look at Tammy I mean yeah and and, and credit to you for saying credit to Espelicueta because his crossing he has his moments with his crossing that was a good ball to Tammy Abraham, but I mean, I can just envision Reese James putting in peaches to someone like Tammy Abraham. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just, I just don't see. I am willing to put my reputation on the line <laughs> if I'm wrong about Reese James. I mean, I think he's going to be that good, and yeah. it, uh, it, it's great if Aspilicueta can keep up maybe the level he played against Norwich because healthy competition position battles are great Mm. you know they're great and Chelsea are going to be in all competitions this season so obviously Reese James is not just even if Reese James does really well he's not just going to become an outright starter in every competition Um, but you know it's a great problem to have and I just cannot I can't wait I think Chelsea as good as they've looked in moments against Liverpool and then you know the first 20 minutes against Leicester City and then uh, you know a good amount of the game against Norwich Mm. I think getting Reese James out there makes this team so much more complete because obviously 
there's a little lopsidedness to the attack. Emerson is so good at going forward, and Azpilicueta does have his limitations. You put Reese James out there in a game where Emerson is also out there, you can really attack from so many different points of view. Yeah, that's a, it's a, for me, it, it really will, it really will rather change that much. Um, it is so lopsided at the moment. Emerson's actually having a beast of a season or so far. He's playing really, yeah. really well, so he looks like the dynamic um, you know, forward-thinking fullback that you want, and Reese James can absolutely be the one on the other side, and he could keep the positive theme of playing the academy youth going, which is really only a positive. You know, I don't know why Lampard's getting a bit defensive about it because it's what Chelsea's <laughs> wanted for forever. You know, best academy arguably in Europe, up there certainly. Um, and it needs to be used, so he shouldn't be apologised for using them at all. And um, yeah, ab you're absolutely right to have the utmost confidence in um, in the young lad because I think it was Joe Tweedy was telling me he spoke to someone who he's like he's like uh, he's a writer for Wigan or, or like um, maybe, Paul Kendrick. Maybe he wrote something yeah. that said like he there's an argument to be made that he's the best player that's ever played for Wigan. I don't know if that's yeah. it. Yeah. Paul Kendrick. Paul Kendrick. Yep. It was Paul Kendrick. Yeah. Go. Hey, and yeah, go on. Yeah, and he, not to cut you off, he just, he, he needed to clarify in that article, yeah. not greatest career for Wigan, obviously, because it was one season for Reese James, yeah. but in terms of just what they saw from a specific player, yeah. uh, like, there's a real argument yeah. to be made. Yeah. And, I mean, it's just crazy that a teenager meant that much to a club. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and, and by, I haven't read the, the piece Sadly, but by all accounts, it was a convincing argument. Um, and um, yeah, again, he's a he's a teenage fullback. I mean, fullbacks, like I said, they're becoming more glamorous and whatever. But it's still mm -hmm. like a, a right back lone need who's a teenager, which is just you know, it's just mind boggling, man. But it's dope. So cool. So defense looks like I can move forward. Um, Preseason, I was not worrying about Chelsea, but I was being incredibly realistic semi-pessimistic saying you know what Chelsea might finish seventh we've lost 49% of our goal contributions in the league from Hazard Lampard's finding his feet as a coach he's gonna got transfer ban he's gonna try and implement youth we've got injuries in Kante Loftus-Cheek Hudson-Odoi I think we might finish seventh I sort of said um, and that's okay and I actually said Leicester might get fourth so I was having a proper like nerdy analytical moment but we'll see what happens with Leicester <laughs> but even though we've only got one win in the first three games the way Chelsea are playing they're absolutely performing like a team that can be successful in the Premier League. Um, and you think of people who have to return like Rhys James, like hudson Adoy, and like Loftus-Cheek. And for me, they're all starters in a healthy team down the road. And Tammy Abraham is a starter as well. And maybe Christensen, who's academy as well. We're suddenly, we're suddenly looking like, so what's that, Rhys James, uh, Christensen, Loftus-Cheek, hudson Adoy. Tammy Abraham that's suddenly like half your outfield players are from the academy you know so it's um it's looking like it's starting to play dividends but do you see all those lads coming into the first team um do you think Tammy can definitely hold a spot as a striker I uh, just generally want to get your thoughts on how you see the sort of final final resting place that sounds like something's gonna die <laughs> the final <laughs> the final look of the 11 come the end of the season how do you see it looking uh, well, I mean, certainly hudson Adoy, definitely assuming he just comes back and kind of progresses as we all hope and expect. Absolutely. I think it's pretty clear that Pulisic will be one of the starting wingers, mm -hmm. but Pedro right now is just being an absolute, you know, true professional mm -hmm. like we expect from Pedro. I uh, know, unfortunately, now he's hurt, but just, just, just playing... before you go on, Alex, just before yeah. you go on, which side for yep. Pulisic and Hudson Adoy? I know they'll probably switch uh, in game, yeah. but what would you think they'd be starting positions, which flank each? Because bearing in mind, Hudson Adoy's got a sweet, sweet cross for his right foot, and Pulisic does look mm -hmm. good playing on the left and playing on the shoulder. So, what do you think? Yeah. So I mean, it's a great conversation, and I mean, I had the pleasure of speaking to Mark Pulisic, Christian's dad, and he was adamant that Christian looks better on the left side, and I think Christian agrees with that. Uh, with that said, and a good point there on Hudson Odoi's ability to cross from the right. I mean, if he played more, Morata might still be here. He, you know, <laughs> Hudson Odoi was putting balls on just his noggin in the yeah. perfect spot, but. I still think it would probably, if we had to lean towards one side, I think it still would be Pulisic on the right wing. It's not like Pulisic's going to put up a stink. That, yeah. That's not the type of kid he is. He's going to be totally fine with it. And Hudson Adoy, just just the way he can come in onto his right from the left hand side is so terrifying. But also remember back to the preseason 
last season. His first contribution was a really nice left-footed cross to Pedro for a preseason goal against like Perth or somebody like that. Yeah, yeah. He can he can cross it on that side. Um, it's just with with Azard and, and remember William was getting all these backup starts at left wing when Azard wasn't out there last season. Yeah. So, and, and Sarri even admitted not to get too in on sorry that he's better on the left yet he played hudson Adoy primarily on the right mm. so i would assume hudson Adoy would get more time um on the less left but yes the, the goal mm. is for them to be able to interchange yeah, and exactly. not have yeah. uh, defensive you know um problems with that and, and i and i think obviously lampard and morris will will know what hudson Adoy can do early on yeah. but yeah i would assume hudson Adoy on the left and Pulisic on the right and, and to get back to your question um you know, so Hudson Adoy definitely a starter. Um, Reese James, if he, if he plays the way we all hope, Lampard is going to give him that chance to be the starter. I mean, he's going to. Um, what happens to Aspilicueta? Who knows? Maybe he plays a couple of games at center, but who the heck knows? Mm. Maybe Alonso's so far out of the team as Aspilicueta also becomes backup left back. I mean, who, I, I have I have no way of knowing, but uh, Reese James will have that opportunity to win win the starting job. Loftus Cheek, assuming he's coming back and he's really going to be fully healthy i mean he's the one i'm most nervous about health wise mm. obviously um just because of how many injuries he's had and the fact that his achilles injury was worse than hudson yes. is even though now all of a sudden he, he apparently is not that far off mm. um but yeah if, if loftus cheek is loftus cheek he's a starter tammy abraham he'll have the most opportunities out of the three strikers to win that job yeah. and um so you would assume that if tammy can just be serviceable he would also be a starter mm. so i i think Jan, and Christensen, I think, you know, he'll have that opportunity as well, even with Rudiger back in the mix. I think the big conversation that I'm sure you see all over Twitter is what happens to Mason Mount once Loftus Cheek gets back? And this is the, like, I don't think anybody knows. I don't even think Frank Lampard necessarily knows, but I'm seeing a lot of people, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying this because I'm such a big Mason Mount fan, but I'm seeing a lot of people just say, oh, well, Mason Mount will go to the bench. Are you sure about no, that? He's... Do do you understand how much Frank Lampard rates and likes Mason Mount? Mm. I wouldn't just say, "Oh, Mason Mount's going to go to the bench and Loftus Cheek gets back." Yeah, I yeah. think that's what maybe that's what you on Twitter would do, yeah. but that is probably not how Lampard is thinking. It's a great problem to have. Yeah. It's a phenomenal problem to have, but also Remember, Frank Lampard talked about, I think it was when Loftus Cheek signed his new contract. He talked about Loftus Cheek actually being able to play a little bit deeper. We've seen other managers try Loftus Cheek even more forward. I think that was, yeah. So I don't know, but I think if Lampard thinks they're all deserving, he'll find a way for those players to coexist. Yeah. And that's really exciting. Just on that, because that's a really interesting uh, topic. Mount, for me, well, he's been off form player essentially um he's amazing in the number 10 he can play really well apparently on that left flank in a 4-2-3-1 um because he was he was roasting alexander arnold when he came on in yeah. the super cup um so so you can play but for me if it's a 4-3-3 in the left center mid spot in a 4-3-3 ruben loftus cheek is an absolute beast um and this mm -hmm. is why it's a good headache to have because when Hazard wasn't, wasn't on this day last season, the, the player to get you out of your seat was Ruben. He was the one who picked oh, yeah. up the ball from that perfect uh, spot where he operated in left centre mid. He dribbled, like I say, like Hazard. He's like an Anthony Joshua version of Hazard. But, you know, he can <laughs> hold the ball very well. People were bouncing off him. And he was scoring the same sort of goals as Hazard, curling it top corner. He'll get a scrappy goal in the box. He was, seemed like just under Hazard in terms of our most important players. Like he got six league goals when he came into the team mm -hmm. from open play. Uh, it's the same amount of goals as Pogba got from open play last season, which apparently he was amazing. And Ruben did it in about a quarter of the time or something. He, it's not mm -hmm. just the goals though, it's how it's like, right, the system's not working, the combinations are not working, screw it. I'm going to pick up the ball from deep, not from, from deep, and literally drive through and there's no nothing anyone can do about it. So that's like such a valuable asset now that's in a 4-3-3 he's the best there but in a 4-2-3-1 it, it mason mount wins because he plays two spots he plays the 10 better than ruben and he plays the left wing better than ruben because he's a technical more slight player so it's almost like you've got mm. two well, see, i know ruben's not that young but two youngish elite players that kind of do different things so for me it's going to be formation dependent and it's going to be mm -hmm. a good headache for Lampard to have but like you say it, it, Lampard's 
got an evident soft spot for Mount. He's clearly incredibly talented, and he just likes his application and you know work ethic and stuff. So um, that's an interesting one. That's an interesting debate. I've just realised we've we sort of run we sort of run uh, to half an hour. So I want to ask you a couple more questions, and then I want to want to plug your work, man, and then we'll wrap up. Um, okay, so very exciting. Exciting ethos, exciting coach, exciting players, uh, patience, um, lower demands from the fan base because they like what they're seeing. They like what the noises the coach is making. Mm-hmm. Do what are your expectations for the season now? Okay, so I'm going to ask you a few questions. This is just off the dome piece, Alex. Who's going to mm-hmm. be our top scorer, and how many goals are they going to get? <laughs> okay, so this is all speculation. No one's gonna grill you for this in like nine, nine, eight months, dude. So I want like, approximately top goal scorer, top assister, um, player of the season, and then how do you know? And then how well does the team do? As in, like you know, Premier League finish, and do you get a cup or anything? So let's hear it. Okay, so so top goal scorer, Tammy Abraham, yeah. and I might not have said that last week, no, yeah. but now seeing him get the brace and I would assume he'll start versus Sheffield United mm. be great if he could pick up another one and head into the international break like that yeah, uh, I'm gonna say Tammy I'm gonna say Tammy Abraham uh some might say Mason Mount and that would be a bad thing if that ended up happening mm. but I'll say Tammy mm. top assister you know what I'm gonna say Christian Pulisic uh he has one but I'm going to say he's going to get enough opportunities. He's certainly going... He, it, what I like about Pulisic is he keeps his head up when dribbling. Mm. And even though actually there was a play against Norwich where I wish he squared it to Tammy Abraham yeah. and he shot it and hit side netting, yeah. I, I think he absolutely will be looking for a pass, especially when even more talented players are out there. Mm. So I'll say Pulisic. Good show. Now, the next the next one was... Where do I expect him to finish? Is that player the Player of the season. So like... Player of the season. Player, oh, players okay. player of the season. Whatever it is, they give out the awards. But, you know, you're... Yeah. You know, so just, just, oh man. (laughs) You know, part of me like wants to say Kovacic, but I'm not going to say Kovacic, even though I'm really encouraged by how he's playing and Lampard loves him. Mm. I'm not going to say him just because if Conte is getting fit again, which we all hope he is, Mm. obviously Kovacic in certain situations will just have to be a badass super sub. Mm. And I don't think he'll play enough then to get that award. Mm, But maybe keeping in that conversation, I'll choose Jorginho. I'll choose Jorginho because Jorginho has just, at at this point, I think people know not to look at stats with Jorginho, Mm. like goals and assists, Mm. obviously. And I, I just think people are really starting to respect and uh, respect what he does, but also understand that he was not just a player who could play in one system. Mm-hmm. He was not just playing because Sari was there. Mm-hmm. I think there's newfound respect for Jorginho. He means a lot to Jorginho. his team. And also, <laughs> yeah, that was amazing yeah. to see and, and, and so good. That's such a feel good thing. Definitely. And also, Jan, yeah. the, reason, the reason why I would say Jorginho as well is it, it, indirectly, if Reese James does displace as Pilquetsa, get him out. Jorginho, I think the rumor is because that team photo that he might be vice captain. Mm. So I think it's pretty clear how important Jorginho is to Frank Lampard. So I think you're going to see maybe Kovacic and Conte, depending on fitness, switch off with each other a lot. Yeah. But I see Jorginho being out there a crap load. So I'll say Jorginho for player of the season, cool. player whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then and now where they finish? That's, that's it, the yeah. next one. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, man, so I was such a coward the whole summer. I said fourth to seventh, fourth to seventh, which is saying like nothing. Yeah, like yeah, all yeah. it's saying is, it's just saying I don't think it's going to be eighth to tenth, like some people said. Um, I'm going to say fifth, which stings because obviously I want that fourth spot. Mm. But I'm going to say fifth, and if I could just add an asterisk on it, I'm going to say in a weird way, it's going to be a feel good fifth. Because the one thing I do expect is that we'd be getting, Chelsea be getting fifth place based heavily on players for the future, Mm. which is different than if you get fifth place and Pedro's your top score or Willian's your top score. So if, if the youngsters are the ones who are maybe some of our brighter players, then I think fifth is a little easier to swallow. So I'm going to say in a weird way, because usually this is kind of an oxymoron, a feel-good fifth. No, I like it. What about, okay, so I've 
been subscribing recently to the theory that Lampard is an incredibly good tournament manager. Um, he did very well with Derby um, when he was at the League Cup when he came to the bridge and they probably played better mm-hmm. than us. Um, I, yeah. I was behind other than Matthew Harding um, lower at that game and I was just terrified of getting outplayed by a bunch of kids from Derby. In a way, obviously <laughs> one old Trafford and, and in a way, this is what I said before, that um, the playoffs are kind of like a little bit like tournament football. The way he inspired his players through that Leeds result, I think he could do that in tournament um, fixtures, like a, a cup. So... Um, do you agree yeah. with that? And do you see Chelsea maybe winning the FA Cup or League Cup, maybe? Uh, bearing in mind, it, City might not be as keen because they've done the domestic quadruple now. Maybe they'll send the kids out, hopefully. Do you think there's a chance Chelsea could do something? Why not? Yeah. I mean, why not? Because I do agree that I think Lampard is hes a good game-to-game manager, which really sets up well for tournaments because you're just, you know, it, it's all about that next game and it's all about kind of preparing for that opponent. And some of these tournaments, you know your opponent like way ahead of time. So, yeah, um, I, I do think Chelsea, because of Lampard, can make a great run in either the League Cup or the FA Cup, but also because I do expect youth to play even more in, in those tournaments. I mean, I still think half of these guys, more than half, are going to be starters, but maybe when there's a cup game coming, the next Premier League game will maybe cater to some older players if you can get away with that, and they'll want more continuity in a cup game and really have a lot of these players who played together at academy level out there with each other. And yeah, maybe City would you know start to actually play a Foden and some other young players. But like when you now see Chelsea, who in my opinion have the best academy, have these players in the side and they could play together in cup games, I mean, they're going to have a better squad probably than all the teams they're facing, you know, maybe arguably except uh, another side or two. So Mm. yeah, why not? Mm. And I also do just to branch off of that is I think if Chelsea finished fifth and if in Frank Lampard's mind, he is also thinking fourth to seventh. Well, I think he also knows that Chelsea is where you need to get trophies. And I don't think he's worried for his job if he doesn't get a trophy this season, not at all. But I do think he knows how important it is to get a trophy. So I'm sure he will stress that these competitions need to be taken just as seriously. And the way players seem to rally around Lampard, I expect they would take these tournaments balls to the wall, 110% seriously. So yeah, and I'm very hopeful that you know even a league cup title would be awesome and i'm hopeful that does happen yeah love it well there you have it ladies and gentlemen positivity as expected from mr alex goldberg so we'll take a couple of minutes <laughs> man i'm sure the viewers have enjoyed this video or hope they have um where can everybody find you because you do have a youtube channel you've obviously got a presence on social media and twitter um, which is just at Alex Goldberg underscore, I believe, maybe. Cool, yep. that's it. Yep. Um, you've got a YouTube channel where you do um, reviews of matches, and also you've got an excellent podcast where you've had Chelsea players, um, you've had respected journalists, reporters, broadcasters, um, referees. It's um, really quite the impressive portfolio. So just take a couple of minutes, man, and tell the people where they can find you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I'll just, you know, the YouTube channel is the byline and you already said my Twitter. So, yeah, the podcast is kind of what I just call my baby uh, until my wife actually has our baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but he'll still be my baby yeah, as well. Yeah, you're f- so, your first yeah. <laughs> if you're first Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, it's also called The Byline. It's The Byline Podcast. You can find it on Patreon. Um, so, you know, it's just a podcast I like to try and do twice a week at least. And in the summer, it was just exclusively interviews with people in the football world that I found very interesting. Uh, But in the summer, when not much is going on, you can really go any direction with it. Like you can have, you know, like you said, referees, like I had Howard Webb on and then Gav Marcotti and then I think Reese James, you know, so it was just all over the place. Mm. Um, But the summer is just different. Mm. So here in the season, I mean, it's still mainly interviews Mm. and and I hope that level of interview is the same if not better um and you know i i can say that i have people scheduled that i think people will enjoy listening to yeah. um but I, but i am and this is probably like maybe the first time i've said this since this is brand new i am trying to incorporate more what's going on with the chelsea season via my guests so after like the manchester united game here in the united states nbc sports does the coverage so um robbie earl he, he used to play in england but uh robbie earl is a good commentator and he did the game so I thought 
let me have him on. He was at Old Trafford and, you know, he can speak more on it. Mm. And uh, my next episode is Norwich City right back Max Aarons. So, you know, that's relevant and topical. I'm obviously going to be talking to him a little bit about how Chelsea looked to him. Um, So I I, I definitely am still going to go any which way I want with the guests, Mm. um, but try to make it a little bit more topical to what's going on with Chelsea's season. I've had to reschedule it, but Mason Mount being on the podcast is still very, very, very much on. Mm. Um, So, you know, stay tuned for that as well. Mm. So, yeah, it's just... um, Blockbuster, man. (laughs) Yeah, so, yeah, Yeah. yeah, it's, it's dope, but, like, you know, I'm sure the viewer would agree Ever, obviously, 90% of my YouTube channel viewers will be Chelsea fans. But although they'd be, you know, incredibly excited to have to hear all those amazing Chelsea guests, everyone who's a football fan wants to hear, you know, someone that they follow, it's, it's saying Alex Goldberg, they want to hear you talking to, say, a Gab Marcotti or, you know, anyone of self in the world of football. It's interesting. So, yeah, absolutely superb, high quality level of guest, mate. So appreciate that no, thank you pleasure mate and thank you for coming on to talking chelsea alex it's been fun man we've we've basically just waxed lyrical about positive stuff for <laughs> 40 minutes man so uh yeah thank you very much for coming on mate absolutely y'all. it was a pleasure and keep up all the great work you're doing and yeah let's do this again sometime soon definitely and uh reptiles out <laughs> <laughs> you ain't so tough with that bad boy tuck I'ma get it how I'm living, I'ma walk the walk Outline my lines, I rap through thought Body bag the verse, outline the chuck In my life seen trouble, hustle on the double Silence on the trigger like my pick got a muzzle Yo chick like to guzzle, bad boy stay in trouble I only love this paper, sorry I don't I love me, baby